Oh, we finally found some boletes. So, um, so far we only looked at gilt mushrooms and now we have a tubed mushroom. Which one do I take? These are, uh, ooh, some are already totally liquid. Others are quite old. That looks a little better here. Um, uh, it's also already a little old. Let's see, do we have... So when you look down below, you see it has these pores or tubes. Technically they're known as tubes. Sponge-like, soft. They can be peeled up. Well, there's a rotten mushroom down below, so that doesn't work as well. And uh, that mushroom also has a ring here, and it's quite sticky. Let's see if we get a fresher one. Usually there's always some more around. Oh, oh, over here. Um, oh. Yeah, there should be some others somewhere here. They're usually fruit in groups. Oh, they are right there. Much better shape. Okay, um, look at that. Oh, I want to just take one and not disturb all of them. Let's see if I can. There we go. Uh, now, this is closer to prime. Already somebody munched on them. Some slug or so. So and it looks like, you know, I notice a lot of mushrooms that get eaten by slugs and other critters. Is that the case? And Oh, it's protein. It's, it's when you take the water out, which is 90%, then the 10% dry matter, more than a third or a third is protein. So they are really full of protein and um, all kinds of sugars. I mean, you know, not sugar sweet necessarily, but, but complex, big sugars. But there's, there's a lot of nutrition in a fungus. It's pretty close to meat, actually. And this year, where the mushroom season, because we had such a dry late August and the first half of September, the mushrooms are quite delayed. And you can just see how everything is like rushing out to get the mushrooms <laughs> because there's just less. And like in my yard, I find a little bullet and then I come back two hours later because I want to take a picture and the squirrel already <laughs> destroyed it. It's going, it's going so quick. Anyway, so here we have a, one of the slippery jacks, Swillus, uh, a genus in, in the Boletes, and it has a ring, which Swillus always got to have a ring or dots on the stem, and the, te the cap got to be sticky, slimy, or scaly. And now this one here, see the blue? So we have a blue oxidation going on. I just broke a little piece out and it's turning blue as I'm speaking. So this is Swillus carolescence. And carolescence, uh, carolus or so is blue um, in Latin and the essence is the process of bluing. I think the common name, Jim, you pointed out is Douglas fir Swillus. Swillus, which, well, jack sometimes, you know, oh, for the well, slippery, slippery jack. jack is, yeah. Isn't that a different one? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a different uh, Swillus. So um, these guys are edible, but um, if you cook them as they are, the, the consistency is not there. It's very mushy. So the best to do is drying them and then grinding them and turning them into a mushroom powder. And then for spicing soups and sauces, they are perfect. Um, but of course, as survival food, they do work. Oh, there I see something else right over here. What's that? Ah, and that's another bullet. Well, it's not a bullet, but it's related to the bullets. But it's a gilt mushroom. And when you zoom in here, can you see that it has a translucent, a jelly-like uh, partial veil that protects the immature gilts. So not many mushrooms have that. And by the yellow stem base here and the coloration, I know it's one of the gomphidias, the insidious gomphidias. Um, I think that's Oregonensis, Gomphidius Oregonensis. And um, they are in the, in the Boletalis, in the order of Boletes. And when they're actually, when they're mature, one can peel the gills like the sponge here. And I didn't show that, but the sponge comes off in, in sheets. And you can also get the gills off in this guy. Also edible, but um, not much taste. And uh, you gotta peel the jelly layer. So maybe insidious, there's a reason why this pun is used on them. And sometimes you can see how I can peel here the jelly layer. So this jelly layer is, is 
this is all protection that's to fight off the slugs and so on um, and you know when it's when it's wet then it's really sticky and slimy and as a slug I don't know as a slug you should probably mistake that for a potential partner but um, <laughs> apparently there might be some toxins in there you know it might attack their skin I don't know um, so uh, pretty cool little mushroom nobody picks for food and that's the good thing you know all these mushrooms they're perfectly fine doing what they need to do in the forests without having to be food for humans and these guys for example these are ectomycorrhizals so these mushrooms are root associated they their main function is pulling water and nutrients out of the ground and feeding Douglas firs and all these hemlocks and many of most of our trees work with ectomycorrhizal mushrooms and um, especially the phosphorus and nitrates um, most of them are supplied by these ectomycorrhizals feeding the tree and the tree pays back in sugars because the tree can turn sunshine into sugar through photosynthesis and up to 60 percent of all the sugars a tree is producing it is actually put back into the fungal network because these guys work so hard for the trees pulling out most of the water and the nutrients and handing it over to the roots so the mycelium of the mushroom that fine white network connects to the end of the roots and at the end of the roots they have a special place where they hand over it's like a finger glove the mycelium is around um, dull root ends and at that point there's all the exchanges happening and the tree pays close attention to how much nutrients and water it gets from a specific mushroom and pays back so there's like an economy an underground economy is going on some economists said the idea we could study a non-human economy uh, because there's also a lot of competition on uh, one Douglas fir might have over 100 fungal partners on their roots so um, you know all of them of course want some sugars of the tree but they gotta deliver and so who is given the best rates and so um, there's a lot still to be uh, learned especially when you go on, on that level of understanding. So I, I heard that uh, the vast majority of, of vascular plants rely on mycorrhizal fungi is that right? Um, mycorrhizal in general yeah but I now talked about ectomycorrhizal which is um, uh, is these bolides um, especially and the amanitas and the russulas and the corals and so on these are ectomycorrhizals and they're especially dominant uh, in the northern hemisphere because their main families is pine family so that's all the conifers but not the cypress juniper redwoods um, cedars red cedars they're not part of the ectomycorrhizal world but all the other conifers are and then there is also the oak family um, or beech family which is uh, huge so not ectomycorrhizal is much easier to say who is not ectomycorrhizal and that's like uh, red cedar maple and um, out here that's basically it mostly but now new research suggests that it doesn't seem to be as clear as a line that they might also have some sideline business with others the other group are the arbuscular mycorrhizals and that's basically all plants work with them that's a different different class of fungi are they inside the plant or are they because you use the yes. word ecto which means right ecto yeah. is outside that's like the finger glove i derived and the arbuscular were before known as the endo uh, endophytic fungi they they grow into the into the root cell and exchange nutrients that way and um and that one the arbuscular system uh, is is also much more spread in the tropics the ectomycorrhizals are not as dominant in the in the in the tropics they're more uh, temperate uh, much more prevalent in the in the temperate zone and then we have also some other associations like uh, the rhododendrons the ericaceae family rhododendrons um, huckleberries they're all one family and the uh, manzanita and madrones they have their own system uh, the ericoid 
and then there is and morels for example we don't know really what they do sometimes they grow very specifically with a tree but then they can live without that tree too so that's still not understood what's really going on but they've been working together for I mean some people speculate that it was actually the fungi that helped the algae to come come on land that the fungi were providing the roots while connecting to the plants when they were still restricted to water and wetlands and so that connection between the mycelium and the plant roots uh, goes back to the day when the plants came out of the water.